So you may be thinking, why is this attorney talking about equity dilemmas? He should just know about the law and the boring stuff we discussed in the other presentation. Well, I may look like an attorney, but in essence, I'm an entrepreneur like you guys. And my project, the widget, happens to be law, and we started 11 years ago. It's called Ferrajoli. It's an entrepreneurial project. We have created 100 employees, basically, in, in, in 10 years in a very difficult economy. And I want to share with you certain of the insights that we have gathered throughout the years regarding repartiendo el bacalao, like Carlos said, which is a very, very important issue. So today, we're going to discuss various very important dilemmas. The first one, the co-founder dilemmas, whether I should found with someone else or do it solo on my own. Second, how will I distribute the equity, the ownership, on that day one when we start our business? Third, other things that come up uh, at time zero. Then, should I look for investors and when to look for investors and for how much and for how much equity? Then, how do I incentivize, incentivize my employees, giving them equity, which is part, part, part of the ownership of the business? And finally, when do I exit, when do I capitalize, when I do receive the benefits of all this effort and investment? So first, I cannot take ownership of Founders Dilemmas. It's a Harvard professor called Noah Wasserman that in 2013, he wrote an amazing book, which all of you uh, aspiring or existing entrepreneurs should purchase, which is called The Founders Dilemmas, Anticipating and Avoiding the Pitfalls That Can Sink a Startup. It's mandatory reading. If you haven't read it, read it, to, read it tonight. It just goes and delves into the common issues and dilemmas and controversies that entrepreneurs will face and the multiple decisions they have to make. And if they do not get it right or if they commit too many of the common mistakes, it could really sink the startup. And most of the founder dilemmas can be summarized in two. Do I want control or wealth? And some just want control and wealth. And we'll see about that very soon. So you have the bright idea, right? You want to start a business. You found your market opportunity. Should I start that business on my own or should I find someone else to help me out, to go through this journey together with me? There's certain advantages to co-founding, not doing it solo, having someone by your side. In essence, it allows you to divide and conquer. You obtain certain things that you may not have on your own, and that's coined as human, social, and financial capital. You can get additional motivation by collaborating with someone else. I co-founded my startup with my partner, and it really helped me out. We both fed on each other to actually try to achieve some type of, of success. And it also allows the, the venture to thrive when it's a fast-moving industry, when time is on the, of the essence, when you really need to move and to capitalize on taking your product to market on a timely basis. And again, just spreading the work. You, you may be very talented, you may have all the financial, social, and human capital needed, but one thing that you may not have is all the time in the world to actually do everything you need to do for the business to thrive. Going quickly into the different types of capital, which you may look for a co-founder to supplement your own human capital, different areas of expertise, skill sets, they may complement your own. You may be a very technical person, so you get you know, your hipster, your hustler, your hacker. If you're just a hipster, you get the hustler and the hacker, and, and the other way around. You complement each other. Financial, you may have a limited amount of funds, or you may have enough funds, but you don't want to put them at risk, or you just want to partially put your funds at risk. So you find a partner that actually brings not only human, financial, and, and other types of capital, but actually gives you seed money and social capital. This could be very powerful, and all of you who have more mature business will know that you need the network to get employees, to get investors, to get clients. If you're in a room, in the dark, just doing your code and trying to make it happen, no one really knows about you, you may be missing out on big opportunities, and that social capital can be brought by a co-founder. Some downsides of co-founding which you have to take the good and the bad to make your decision whether you want to start your business with someone. Loss of control. If you're a control freak, if you want to make all the decisions on your own, forget about the co-founder. It's just going to add additional layers of complexity to the decision-making process, which could actually make you lose traction in the business. So it could help you in certain sense, but if you really need to control the decision-making, then you may have to do it on your own. 
and obviously sharing the equity. If you want to bring a co-founder who has you know, certain expertise, certain capital, certain contacts, it's going to cost you. So you're going to get diluted, and you have to share the wealth at a very, very early stage without truly knowing what that person will do. Because he can say, you know, I'll take care of, of the design. I'll take care of the marketing. Don't worry. I'll raise the funds. But you don't have any assurances that it would actually play out. It could be a fluke. You know, it could be that that person really did not have the contacts, did not have the capabilities, did not have the experience, and you gave him 50% of your business. OK, who gets what percentage on day one? That's the question, right? It's a group of friends, a group of acquaintances. You maybe had the idea together. Uh, you, you, you were introduced by some strategic. So how do we divide that pie? The idea premium. Who had the idea? Typically, the person who has the idea gets a little bit more. Typically, it's like 5%. They're going to argue it should be 90%, but typically, it's like, it's like 5%. Second, how much time and effort will each of the persons invest in the venture? If you have someone who's going to be part-time in the venture versus another partner who will be full-time, the full-time partner you know, could get additional equity because of the additional effort that should be put in. And not less important, how much assets were contributed. Let's say you have an invention, you have a patent, you have a widget, and you contribute that widget to the, to the startup. That has value. That should entitle you to receive a certain portion of the equity because the business needs your widget to go forward, to move forward. Also, that also applies to cash. And this is the tricky, sticky one, roles and responsibilities going forward. Again, people may commit to do certain things, and there's no certainty that they will actually do. So be very careful when you're basing your equity split up in things that people will do in the future. Because as I will discuss in other slides, we have to be very careful with that, and we have to put some belts and suspenders so it actually works, and we avoid controversy. Things to consider while we are dividing the pie. Time-based vesting. Because so many people say, look, it, to make sure that the person does what he has to do, let's just do a vesting schedule. All of you have heard of vesting schedules. Let's do a three-year vesting schedule, a five-year vesting schedule. That's fine because it actually makes sure that the person stays if they want to keep their equity. But it could, be, it could become pain for a pulse. The person is there. He's doing nothing, but his vesting is only based on being there. So you're getting no benefit out of it, but you made the wrong bargain. He is entitled to get vested in his equity if you did not take into consideration milestones and conditions. Right? One thing is being there, and another thing is actually achieving something. So we want to make sure we take both things into consideration so we create the right incentive. The incentive cannot be just sit there from 9 to 5 and watch me work. It has to be more than that. You have to achieve certain sales. You have to achieve certain development schedule. You have to achieve certain time to market. And the most sophisticated item of the whole presentation is the dynamic equity distributions. It's rarely used, but some people, like Wasserman for Harvard, he's a big fan of those. What does it say? In your contract, make sure that you state that if circumstances change, let's not say it's my effort, it's not my willingness to do it, but maybe we agreed that if you took X product to market in two years, you would get 30% vested, but the company changed its course, and we're pursuing another opportunity. So then you have a situation where that person could keep achieving and pursuing that particular project, but it's of no value to the business, right? So we have to have a provision in the agreement that says, if the circumstances were to change under this criteria, we would reassess the equity distribution, and we would reassess the milestones, and we would reassess the benefits. Let's avoid certain things, and we are, all of us, are very prone to do it this way. The quick handshake. You know, I'm a fair person, let's do it 50-50, we are partners, you know, it, and just do the quick, quick handshake. That's very dangerous, because when we have a VC later on that comes and wants to understand how you achieved your equity distribution on day one, if they smell it was a quick handshake, they're going to get spooked. They're going to say, wait, these guys did not think about it. And you know what? That 50-50 quick handshake is going to bring problems down the line because it's going to be evident that X person is putting more effort or X person is putting more, 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 more contacts or X person putting more cash, and there's going to be an inherent natural tension between the founders that's going to put my investment at VC at risk. Again, 
quick handshake on warranted equal parts distribution. If the contributions are not commensurate, are not equal, just avoid the equal distribution. And truly avoid post-founding forced renegotiation. Because if you get it wrong at first, you will have to have a very difficult conversation with your partner, maybe six months later, a year later, or before the investor comes in. Many investors say, if the equity is not distributed correctly, I'm not putting my money in. Because that tension, again, is going to affect the value of my investment. Salaries, it does, does not necessarily or directly have to do with the equity distribution, but you know, the founder's discount is typical. The founder is, is all about the project. It's all about making his baby come to life. So he's willing to take a cut in his salary. I did it. I, I earned nothing for three years, basically, to see the firm grow. And I was very proud doing that. And, and that typically happens until he gets diluted, right? Because at one point, the founder will go from owning 90% of the baby to owning maybe 30%. And at that time, you have to give the founder parity in compensation because then he, he will have two incentives, the project, his equity, and the amount of money he's making. Other things to consider when you're starting the business. Is there true alignment, right, as to the goal of the business? Are, are me and my partners really see eye to eye with respect to what we want to achieve? That's basic, because if we don't have that true alignment as to vision and objectives, the thing will really blow up, and most of them do, actually. Is the equity participation transferable? Again, as I said in the prior presentation, can my fellow co-founder transfer his equity ownership to a total stranger? That's, that's horrible, you know, that simply cannot happen. That could be the end, the end of the business, so we have to, to tackle that, that issue as well in a shareholders agreement. How will the sale of a business be handled? Will it require my consent as founder or the co-consent of the co-founders? Will the investor have to approve the sale? Can the investor force the sale? These are important questions. And many of us simply, you know, we're too involved in the technology or, or the project or the market opportunity. We need to understand this once. You have to go granular once and you have to overcome it once so it, it's part of the success of the business and it doesn't become uh, a detriment. And finally, this is very tough, very difficult, but the conversation must be had. How do we deal with a founder that is not living up to his or her expectations and objectives? We need recourse. We need a way to handle that. Because if not, the discomfort becomes so great that it will affect the future success of the business. Um, and our, uh, additional considerations. If a founder leaves, he says, I'm simply not interested in this venture anymore. I don't, I don't want to partake in this opportunity. I do not trust you. I'm leaving. Is the company obligated to repurchase his participation? Or can he put the participation to the company? Or does he stay as a passive investor in, in the company? All different alternatives and outcomes that can affect the viability of the business. And again, we have to understand all of them at day one and do something about it so we understand the outcome and we're not blindsided by the challenge. Again, let's avoid being unprepared to deal with unforeseen events like termination, resignation, death, divorce, or I simply do not want to work. All those things can happen. And if we don't deal with them on a timely basis, it could affect the value and success of our business. So at all cost, and this is you know, very common sense, but let's avoid destroying value. How do we avoid destroying value? Let's take a week, let's take two weeks, let's take a month to make sure we get our arrangement between the founders right. So we understand what they expect of us, so we understand what we have to contribute, so we understand what happens if we don't comply with the things we said we would comply with. The best shareholders agreement and operating agreements are those that you actually invest time in making and you get it right and you never look at it again. I haven't read mine in 10 years. I forgot what I put in there, but I know it's right. I know I considered all, all the variables and alternatives. And it's, it's like the balance of powers in, uh, among the nations. If you know that everything is addressed in a fair and, and, and just way, people will try to avoid controversy at, at all cost. Okay, outside investors. We, we found it. We decided whether we should have a co-founder or not, or not. We divided the equity. So now we have to consider arrangements to be made with our first investor. Who's our first investor? Friends and family, of course. 
people who trust us, who believe in us, who wants, want us to have great opportunities and achieve great success. So it's the easiest money. It, it is, you know, I have never seen a grandmother doing due diligence on his grandson or a parent doing due diligence on his son that just doesn't work out, right? So it's easy money. It's there for the taking. Um, the, the, these investors, however, we have to take into consideration that they generally do not participate in further rounds. It's, it's, it's time zero. I just want to get my family member, my friend, I want them to get started, so I'm going to give them $50,000, $100,000. They generally have very little human or, 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 or social capital to contribute because it's the same human and social capital you have because these are your friends, these are your family members, so you live within that ecosystem of support. So you already have that. You're just taking their, their money. And there's a huge danger, which is obvious, but let, let's just mention it. It could put long-term relationships at risk. It depends on the families, on the friends, on the relationship, how much, what was said. But you have to consider that you could lose the relationship if you do not do things right as an entrepreneur. And, and that's a very, very important consideration. Angels. Angel investors. Well, basically, angels make smaller investments. It's their own money that's getting invested. And it's in the early stages. They can serve as a bridge between the friends and family and the VCs, right? It's like, 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 a, like an intermediary between two very important aspects. And they, they expect a very high return, right? Because they're invest, investing seed money in a startup that's getting started that does not generally have the sales or the clients or the cloud or the market, market share. So they certainly expect a high return for assuming a, a larger risk. And many times they do become mentors because they have had prior experiences as entrepreneurs and they generally have had some exits, you know, quite successful exits. So they can be a mentor and they can also help attract VCs, which is an important portion of, of the investment. Venture capitalist. These are US-based venture capitalists. These, these are not the local ones. Um, they invest other people's money, right? We, we, all, we all know that. They do invest a lord, larger amount of money. It could be between two, three million dollars on the average. We're talking about larger investments. They will require that you have a formal board or you have a more form, formal corporate governance structure because they want to partake in that. They will demand a seat on the board of directors. They may even demand control of the board of directors for that matter. They do provide generally expertise and mentoring which is something that we need. You know, we, need we need that human capital for our, our business to thrive. And they certainly can bring potential investors to the picture because as you know, we generally do multiple rounds. The VC comes in at the Series A round, for example. He wants to get additional investors on board in future rounds at higher valuations so they can really become your primary source of investors. But it's a, it's a, it's a huge step. And they always dilute you. you know, they will dilute you more than, than your family. They will dilute you more than the angels. And you have to make sure, if you're losing control, how to deal with that. If that were to happen, or of course, try to deflect as long as possible the, the actual loss of control, which is a big moment in an entrepreneur's or in a business life cycle, because it changes the whole way the, man, the, the business is managed. Okay. In Professor Wasserman's study, 212 ventures were evaluated. This took a long time. This is a great, great study. 50% of the founders were no longer in control after three years. 80% were forced out. This happens. Things could end up like this. Once you have a professional investor on board, you better up the ante, you, you start reporting, you start being more formal, you start doing things differently because it just became other people's money. It's no longer your money, no longer your equity. You have a partner with a big financial interest. You found it with $50,000. He invested $3 million. He's going to be on your, I don't want to say that. When dealing with angel investors and venture capitalists, let's just consider a few very important things and take notes. Corporate governance. How will decisions be made? Will I, as founder, keep a seat on the board? And I 
obviously invite you to always achieve that because at the board is where strategy is discussed, is where the future of the business is decided, and it's very important for you to at least have the opportunity to convince your fellow board members of how things should be handled. Maybe you do not have control, you don't have voting control, but you can influence people. And by influencing people, you can have a business that you use to control, take the right direction, and actually achieve your, your, your particular goals. Minority rights, you suddenly have 30%, you used to have 100%. Now you're a minority. What things will you be able to vote on or veto so that you have some type of you know, negative control over your business? Will you still retain rights to authorize big capital expenditures of the business? Or will this VC with his new board be able to actually decide huge capital investments that have a, a, a very you know, nefarious effect of further diluting your control and your wealth? And let's talk about a golden parachute. You no longer control decisions. So if by any strange situation they force you out, you better go down with a bang. You better go down with money. And, and it's much better than be left you know, holding, holding the bag. So that's you after the exit. Other provisions a founder will consider or should consider requiring preemptive rights. Who knows what preemptive rights are? Preemptive rights basically give you the right to keep your percentage in, a, in the business if there's a new round of financing. Let's say you have 30% and they're selling $100,000. If you pony up $30,000, you keep your 30%. You did not get diluted. It's, it's, it's a nice to have. You can always find someone else to give you the money. Right to first refusal. If there were to be free transferability, if someone else is selling his participation, he would have to offer the participation to you. So instead of bringing a stranger, you can put the money, purchase the participation, and then you do two good things. You do not allow a stranger to come in and you have a bigger stake of your business. So it's a it's, it's a win-win, the right of first refusal. And piggyback, let's say this really worked out and we make it to the to the cover story of El Nuevo Dia. You want to make sure that the VC includes you in the filing documents so you can sell your shares together with the shares of the VC. Because if not, it's gonna be very expensive. So that's a great problem to have if the company were to go public. Very quickly, employee incentives. You founded, you brought your investors, the business is doing great, but you have a set of employees that are crucial to the success of the business. We're talking about people who handle the technology, people who handle the sales, people who handle the marketing, and you really want to keep them in your business, and by all means, you don't want them to go with your competition. So. Equity, again, is a strong incentive, and it motivates people to stay. There are four ways to incentivize your employees. This is a little boring. I'll do it very quickly. Phantom equity, restricted equity, straight equity, and employee stock options. If you are considering incentivizing your employees, you have just those four options. And let me quickly explain, explain which is which. The phantom equity is just like a promise. When we sell the business, I'll give you 5% of the proceeds. You're not a shareholder, you do not receive any dividends, but you have an incentive to stay until the exit because you will receive a benefit, right? It's not equity, it's phantom equity. It's very simple, it's very flexible, and it has the advantage to the founder that he retains control. He incentivized an employee without actually diluting himself one point. There's no taxable event at the time of grant, which is also great. You don't want to slap your employee with a tax bill for something that may have no value because we really don't know if the business will actually be, be successful, right? So it's good, it's good. The employee, you're not getting diluted and the employee is not getting a taxable event. And there's no, right, no requirement that you treat everyone equally. You can, your favorite employee can have 5% and your least favorite employee can have 2%. You can decide how much you give to each. Disadvantages, when it's paid out, there's an exit, there's a sale, you go to your employee, you give him the $500,000 check. I have bad news for him, it's ordinary income. Instead of having, let's say, a 10% tax rate, which would be a typical capital gains tax rate, he would be slapped with 33% tax. So not gonna be super happy, but at least he got some, some liquidity. And the, the compensation must be paid in cash, so if there's a deal that you structured with respect to an exit where it's a limited amount of cash, you have to give the cash to the employee. And then you have to take the other consideration, be it property, plant, equipment, or securities. And they do not necessarily get full ownership mentality. They may stay, but they don't feel as owners because you literally made them a promise. You did not give him the stock certificate where they feel they have true ownership. Restricted equity grant, tax attorneys, which I'm not, thank God, 
love restricted equity grants. It's good because the employee actually feels like an owner. They own the stock, it's, the, it's theirs. They do receive the dividends. So if you're receiving dividends, they're receiving their pro rata dividends, which is, which is a good thing from a liquidity perspective. Uh, the company retains the ability to recycle the equity. What does that mean? The employee leaves, right? and it's a restricted equity grant. The grant said that he had to stay as an employee for him to have the right to have the stock. So he leaves, you take the stock back, you give it to the new employee that you're recruiting. That's a, that's a very, very, very good outcome for, for the company. And it's also advantageous for the employee nevertheless because there's no tax event at the time that you give him the restricted equity grant. As with everything, there's some disadvantages, but this is you know, very marginal disadvantage, which is that you would have to bring that person into your shareholders, into your operating agreement, and ma make him part of that formal document that gives the company its corporate governance. Straight equity grant. This is very interesting. This is when I tell you, you have five shares. They're yours, nothing else, no restrictions, no nothing. The employee will certainly have owner's mentality because he just became an owner, no restrictions. He will receive his dividends, he's gonna be very happy, but there's a big disadvantage. He's gonna get taxed at the time of grant as ordinary income. So the company may fail, the company may flounder, he may never see one cent out of that stock he received, but he's gonna get a tax bill at the time of the grant. So it's, it's bad in that sense, because although he's an owner, he's not getting any type of liquidity to actually pay his taxes. And will require the, the person to participate uh, in the shareholders agreement. Employee stock option plan, this is what more mature companies do, right? We have grown, we have hundreds of employees, we really need to incentivize everyone at large, so let's think of Banco Popular, right? The employees do assume some owner's mentality because it's, it's spread thin, so, but it's some owner's mentality. They, this is the most important point about the employee stock option. They do benefit as employees of the value they help create. Let's say the business was worth $1 million when they got their option, that is frozen in time. And when they exercise, it could be worth 10 million. So they are benefiting from the increment in value because when they exercise their options, they're exercising their options at the million dollar valuation, not at the $10 million valuation. So they're very incentivized to work hard so the business actually grows. And it can be structured in a tax efficient manner, which is also very advantageous. And the vesting schedule obviously keeps the employees motivated. In order to be tax efficient, we must comply with certain rules which are completely beyond the scope of the presentation. Okay, exit dilemmas. So we found it, we decided whether we have a co-founder or not, we took some, ma some money from our grandmother, we took some money from an angel, we took some money from a VC, that VC did th three or four rounds, we gave some phantom stock, we gave some restricted equity, everything, everyone's happy, and then we get to the point that we may have an exit. So we did so well that someone else may want to buy this business, let's say four, five years. Investors actually expect this. They're not giving you the money to become your friends, they really want to cash out in four or five years. It's highly unlikely that you as a founder, if you got to this stage, you will have a total say on the exit. You will not get the right to decide whether the company sold or not. More likely than not, the investors will decide that, and you may have some type of, of vote. Let's say just a vote, but no, no control. And this is one of, of the freebies. Beware of the drag along right. The investor will want to drag you to a sale. He will want the, the, the shareholders agreement or the operating agreement to say that if he wants to sell, he can force the sale, whether you like it or not. Sometimes it's gonna be a condition to the investment and you'll have to take it. Sometimes you'll be able to negotiate certain belts and suspenders like, you know, you can only drag me as founder if the sale is for, for more than $50 million. Then I'm happy, you know, getting dragged. And this is very technical but fairly important you have to consider whether to accept as a condition to the investment of the VC a liquidity preference. That means, in very simple terms, that if the things did not go out, turn out so good, right, and there's a limited amount of money in an exit, you know, the, the, the business was not a huge success, it wasn't a failure, it's some, some bid along for four to five years, and someone's willing to give us a million dollars, let's say. In that sense, the investor could have negotiated the liquidity preferences and he could get the entire million. So you worked for five years basically for nothing because he negotiated to receive 100% of what's called a very limited upside. Okay, this is the whole presentation. All decisions 
made by you as founders will be influenced whether you want by whether you want wealth or whether you want control or whether you want both. Many control-centric decisions will lead to a true king, right? He owns everything, he controls everything, but maybe his kingdom is not as valuable as it could have been. Wealth-centric decisions, someone who's just looking for, for the money, for el bacalao, like Carlos said, generally is gonna lead to less control, but a much more valuable kingdom, right? He shared the wealth, he brought the grandmother, he brought the co-founder, he brought the investor. So he, 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 he made a very valuable business and he has 30% of the business versus a less valuable business of which he has 100%. But a very select few, I was looking for a picture of Bill Gates, I couldn't only get the Saudi prince, they actually achieve control and wealth. These are the very few and apart entrepreneurs. They achieve both, they control everything and, and they actually achieve a lot of wealth. So think that's Bill Gates instead of the prince. But most, most of them end up like this, in a room, burning in fire, thinking, this is great, you know, we're just gonna do well. It's not that bad, it's not that hot. You know, I'll get out of the room alive. That's the 90% case. So, that's a lot of information, but if you have any questions, we have a, a lot of time left. Hello. So, uh, great presentation, by the way. Amazing. Thank you. Um, it's hard to do this that in an entertaining way, and it was actually pretty entertaining. Right. So, um, just uh, I guess I want to hear some stories from the trenches uh, that you've seen. I mean, you're you know one of the experts in, or probably the expert in Puerto Rico on, this, on these topics. So, um, what are the most uh, either weird or extreme experiences you've had in terms of you know um, stock ownership relationship with founders and things like that? I would say that I have seen very difficult situations with, with VCs sometimes, and it, it all turns down to what you negotiate on day one with the VC, because if you do things right, it can turn out to be fairly fair, uh, but if you do not have the right advice at the end of the day when things get complicated and relationships tend to tarnish through time, then they try to exert a lot of pressure. They try to, as I said, take you out, they try to replace you with someone else. And that's something that, that's fairly common because at first, as, as with everything, it's a love fest. The investor loves you, he thinks you're the smartest person they have met, you love the investor, you have never met someone with so much money, and you know, but in time, people do not see eye to eye. And again, if you did things right from the get-go, you'll be able in a position to, in the balance of powers, actually retain some control, retain some wealth, and actually continue to be part of, of the enterprise. But, but, but things can get complicated, and with, with angels, I have seen great things. You know, it, it tends to flow. It tends to be more of a nurturing relationship, which happens to have some money. So I have advised companies that only made it in the good sense to the angel stage, never did a VC round, and they actually did well, right? So you did not distribute as much control you did create wealth, but you did not overcomplicate things with a professional investor. But again, it depends on, on, a, on, a, on a totally case-by-case -case basis. And I have also seen others that simply have the capital and they go alone, you know, forget. I don't want any outside investors. I don't want any partners. I don't even want my grandmother to participate in this venture. So it depends on the market, the opportunity, the amount of capital required, the amount of people involved and as, as with everything, on a case-by-case on -case basis. But I have seen my share of, of horror stories. No questions? This is no. probably the most important thing in your adventurous life, the equity. Here, I have a question. <clears throat> Aka. Aka. I think also that you did great. This is a very important topic, very uh, difficult to explain, and I, I, I understood what you said. I am a professor in Maya West. I teach entrepreneurship. And this is a topic very, dif very difficult to address. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you can share some resources that we can use as uh, aids or educational complementary material, maybe a website, template, something that we can use to explain this to our students, professors, and entrepreneurs back there in Maya West. And also invite, uh, we want to invite you next semester to, to take this we'll to be Maya there. West. Okay? I, I appreciate uh, teaching. I've been doing it for 12 years. 
The, the book I, I mentioned in my slide, Wasserman's book, that's, it's amazing. Noah Wasserman, Founder's Dilemmas. I read it like in two nights. Actually, I learned of the book because of Carlos Cobian. Uh, we went on vacation together and he said, you haven't read that book and you teach that? Yeah, I haven't read that book. And it, it, it was amazing, but e even for me, I have been doing this for 16 years, it brought a lot of things together. It, things started to make sense. I used a lot of those learnings and I have a lot of experience to actually be able to come up with a presentation. It's, it's an amazing book. Anything else? Fernando, here. I was wondering if you could shed some light on vesting schedules and uh, what more or less goes into them on a, on a general level. Okay, v vesting schedules, the typical would be three or five years, uh, uh, as I mentioned, because you, in, in the business cycle of, of, of your company, one year is too short, two years is too short. You know, the typical in venture capital investment is for five, so anything between three and five is okay. But the most important thing is, let's not get, get our employees to be paid just for having a pause and going to work. Let's put some milestones, let's put some objectives, let's put some, some objective criteria that they will have to achieve in order to be entitled to their, to their stock. Because from a timing perspective, you can do whatever you want. Obviously, the, the longer, the more time the employee will stay. Uh, and, and you could have a rolling basis of incentives, right? You could give an incentives on day one, a couple of years later, that doesn't make sense given the, the, the composition of the business. So then you give new incentives on, on year three, and those run for another three or, or five years. But the essence and the most important factor is, how do I make sure that I get the more bang for my money? How do I ensure that that 5% of my business I give up gives me the value that I need out of that 5%? So you need objective criteria so that person gives you results. And then they can be entitled to their equity. So if they just stayed there without doing anything of value, they literally do not get vested. Sorry, I got the microphone back here for my question. I, uh, I practice here in New Hampshire, intellectual property. And, and I, you know, my, my clients call me Lou ES, exit strategy, because that's like second topic we cover past what's a pattern. Are you seeing, you know, clearly the structure you mentioned in the last talk, the difference between corporations and NLCs. Do, do you think that you have a structure that's very 19th century and set up set Reyes and the rest of the crowd, but is having trouble joining now? Like, what have you seen in terms of exits? My, my, my angel investors for my clients, they want to see a Delaware corporation. They don't want to see anything else because they know that's what's going to sell to the guys at Perkin, at Kleiner, and the guys at Waltham. What are you seeing here that, that clear more transparency that may make it easier for, uh, for, for that step to, you know, you, you keep on presenting all these stateside companies, but, but we want to make the locals get the exit, get the money. Yeah. That's the thing. The, the, the entity is not necessarily what's going to make the investment or the company attractive. There's no such thing. And if it's a private enterprise, like most of the Puerto Rico startups will be, it's going to be a private business probably forever. Without a doubt, and I have had very sophisticated VCs invest in LLCs, I would recommend an LLC. Not because of transparency, but also because of confidentiality. Because you need all the, the advantages as an entrepreneur that you can get. And if having your financial condition secret is, is doable, I certainly would entice you to, to, to do that. Because you want to share that with your VC, with your private equity, with your, with your friends and family, but not with the, with the public at, at large. And also, these businesses grow at such a fast rate that the structure of the corporation, where you have to have a formal board, you have to have a formal shareholders meeting, you need all these bells and whistles and formalities, is not what, in my experience, businesses need. Businesses need the flexibility that the LLC affords, and I have seen dozens of, of, of VCs, state-side VCs, investing in, in, in LLCs. And they do understand that if this is the next big thing, we can convert to a corporation, again, with a single filing without any tax uh, consideration. So it's ha like having the, the best of both worlds. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, I would like to know more about when you talk about employee incentive, if you can go a little bit inside of profit, uh, profit sharing. Uh, I don't know if it's something that we profit. can. Profit sharing is like, a, it's like phantom in the sense that you're just giving them a promise to give them a portion of, of, the, of, the, of the profits. 
they're not equity holders, they don't have shares, they don't have membership interest, they do not receive dividends as such, but they can have 5% of the profits. So if you don't want to get diluted bringing in the employees, you could do a two-fold phantom equity. One would be uh, profit sharing, basically you get X percent of the profits, and then in an exit, I'll honor you that same percent of the sales price. So it's a good question, it wasn't in the presentation. It could be an additional component if you want to keep things very informal from a phantom perspective without actually giving actual equity. But you don't have to give the same uh, no. percentage to you can employees. discriminate. You can give it to one, you can give it to a few, and you can give more to one than, than the others because there's no tax incentive. All right, cool. And the other question, I'm sorry. Uh, best in schedules. Uh, I seen the last uh, contract I was seeing. Uh, in, instead of uh, the best thing was in time, it was on objective. Is this is common? You, you, of course, and that's one of, of, the, of the main points of my presentation. Time is good because you want the employee to stay there, but objectives is what really creates value. So why not have both? You have to stay. If you create value in, in the first three months, if you achieve everything, you're a genius, you're great, you have a lot of experience, you still have to spend some more time in the company. So let's combine both mechanisms and have both time and objectives. Hi, could you delve a little deeper into, I'm not sure if I'm gonna get this right, but the dynamic equity um, breakup option that you mentioned, yeah, and sure. maybe provide some examples? The, let's say, a very simple example. We started, you and I, 50-50. Day one, you're putting half the capital, I'm putting all the effort, or we're both working, 50-50. Very simple, we actually thought about it, and at that time it made sense. In the agreement it says that, for example, if I were to decide to go part-time, Right? My circumstances change. I have even seen examples, and this is odd, and some people may not like it, but it says, if you have kids, circumstances change. And people actually agree that if that were to happen, there's a new equity split pre-agreed. So we don't, do not go through the pain of you telling me, look, you're not going to be working full-time in our venture, and you expect to have 50% of the upside? It doesn't make sense, I'm working harder than you. And it's gonna be very uncomfortable, it's gonna tarnish our relationship, so if we have a dynamic equity provision in our agreement, it will try, right, to track and mimic what would happen if the circumstances were to change. And it's, it's, it's similar to what happens if you die, if you get incapacitated, if you get divorced, you know, so many things that can happen to an entrepreneur which can really affect how the business is run and how the equity is split. And it, 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 it's, a, it's a Wasserman's concept, and it's not really common because it's really difficult. Some people prefer not having that conversation at day one, precisely because it could tarnish their relationship. So I, have, I haven't seen that very commonly in actual deals, but it's, it's a good idea that he has. Is it just like an open clause, or do you specify what it the conditions are? It can be open, are? good, great question. It could be open, it could just state, look, if this were to happen, we're gonna sit down in good faith and figure it out. And if we can't figure it out, we're gonna get a mediator. And if that mediator doesn't help me, we're gonna get an arbitrary. And not, we'll go to court and rip, rip our heads off. But we could also have an, an outcome that's predetermined. And we could say, if, if I were to have kids, then it's gonna be 60-40 because we assume that I will, will want to divide my time between my kids and the business. That's it, thank you. <laughs>